And uh, first of all, my name is Nasser Baraka. Many participants from outside of Jordan, uh, and I believe uh, most of them do not speak Arabic, so uh, bear with me, we're gonna speak mainly in English. If anybody has a question or wants to translate any of the concepts, we will take the time to answer it in Arabic uh, if needed. So I would like to start uh, by thanking uh, the IIA chapter in Jordan, ISACA chapter in Jordan as well, and the Institute of Management Accountants chapter in Jordan. Uh, particularly Mr. Ahmed al Qawasmi, the president of the IIA in Jordan, Mr. Nassim Karmash, president of the IMA in Jordan, and Mr. Hussam Khattab, president of ISACA Amman Jordan chapter. And Iman Botai, she's an operation manager with IMA in Jordan. She's also a co host in this session. This session would, would not have happened without their help. They, they actually work together as one team. We, we built a one group on WhatsApp and they helped us decide on the content, the timing, everything that you see today and everything relating to the campaign. Uh, they had a great contribution too. So I sincerely thank them for making this happen. Okay. Uh, so I will start by introducing myself. As I said, I'm Nasser Baraka and I work for AIGC. AIGC uh, happens to be one of the uh, well-known uh, business risk services or what we call risk advisory services uh, companies in Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and uh, we have joint ventures. We have offices in Jordan and Saudi Arabia, Riyadh and Jordan, plus we have joint ventures in Lebanon, Egypt and UAE as well. So uh, we specialize mainly in risk advisory uh, services. So that would be risk management, internal audit, compliance, in addition to, of course, data analytics and forensic. So we do fraud audits, fraud investigations, and expert witness accounting and so on. We are a member firm of Alenia Global, which is a network of accounting firms. So let me uh, highlight uh, my background as a speaker. Uh, I've graduated with an MBA in professional accounting and a CPA from the States uh, in 1992. Um, then I became a certified control self-assessment practitioner. Actually, I was one of the first to get the certificate, the first group to get a certificate. And uh, I worked as, uh, first of all, as, as an auditor for a regional accounting firm, and then as a financial controller for one of the banks in Jordan. Before I went and joined Grand Thompson in Saudi Arabia in 1997 to establish that advisory practice. Then later on, I became the service line leader and partner in charge of business risk services or risk advisory services in the Middle East. So I've helped many organizations in UAE, Qatar, Palestine, Syria, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, implement uh, risk management systems, risk-based internal audits, and data analytics software solutions. And today we are proud to say that we have helped also well-known governmental organizations move their audit to become uh, automated or what we call data analytics implementation, including the tax authority in Egypt, uh, Jordan uh, Audit Bureau, and the Saudi Audit Bureau as well. With me, uh, there will be also Zaid on Baybala today. Uh, and on the other two sessions, there will be other presenters as well. So I might as well introduce him now. Zaid on is a director with our firm. He has a BA degree in accounting and he has a CIA, CNA, CFE, and a CEDA. CEDA stands for Certified Idea Data Analytics Expert. And of course, we have Othman Barakat, Othman Ahmad Barakat is a CRMA, CEDA expert, and a certified operation risk executive. Hisham El Yafi is a senior consultant with our firm. Uh, Othman is a supervisor, and Hisham El Yafi is a senior consultant. He has a CIA and a CEDA as well. 
So these are three of our data analytics experts. We have others in our team. They are all certified and uh, a total of six people in our team who are certified in data analytics. So this is the content of our presentation today. So our presentation today will start to uh, talk about what is data analytics. Then we're gonna talk about uh, data analytics in internal audit. Uh, the data analytics process, how the process goes, the role of the data analyst, so what does he do as a data analyst, then what type of data he needs to analyze when we talk about data analytics, so what kind of data are we analyzing, what kind of data formats are there as well, how do we gather data and how do we clean the data, because data unfortunately when you want to analyze it, it's not always ready for you and clean. So you need to clean it up to be able to analyze it. So that would be a set for the first session, which uh, myself and my colleague Zay will be covering. For sessions two and three, it will be a bit more practical. I mean, less, less theory and more practice. It would be a bit more advanced. So in session two, we're going to talk about next level of data analytics, so data visualization, trend analysis, sampling using data analytics software, future advancements in data analytics, and artificial intelligence. In session three, we will talk about using data analytics to detect fraud. And of course, that will mean we have to talk about Benford law, we have to talk about analyzing numeric data um, and the you know fuzzy data logic and so on, the practical examples. And finally, reporting data metric results will be also part of session three. Okay, so let us start with. So okay, sorry. Let me let me for the sake of organization. Uh, unfortunately, you know we are really fortunate to to have a large number of participants. And uh, I think we have about 360 registrations. Uh, so we won't be able to, uh, unfortunately, we won't be able to have everybody unmuted to talk whenever they wish. Uh, so what we would suggest is if, if, if you have any question, you can send it to the host. And at the end of every section, uh, I will take the time to answer the questions. And my colleague Zaid will also take the time to answer the questions as well. So we'll start with the first and most important is what is data analytics, right? Now, again, this is an introduction, so bear with me. I know some of you are experts in the field because I know some of you who know about it and are ISACA experts, uh, CISA certified. But at the same time, I wanna make sure that, you know, to, to manage expectations, we're starting from the bottom up. So bear with me as I take the time to make sure that everybody understands what we're talking about. So what is data analytics? The IIA defines data analytics as the process of identifying, step number one, gathering, that would be step number two, and then validating, step number three, and then analyzing data, and then interpreting the various forms of data. So they do recognize that there are various forms of data, which we're going to be talking about and colleague Zaid will be talking about a bit later. Within an organization, the, 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 the analysis is within the organization, but the data could be from outside the organization as well. To further the purpose and mission of internal auditing. Okay? Now that's for internal auditors, but there is another uh, wider definition that covers, you know, management accountants and everybody else as well, data analytics is simply using the results of data collection and analysis to make well-informed and better decisions, okay? So that would be the more general, easier to understand definition. So now based on an article published by ISACA, uh, the importance of data analytics in an organization, uh, it was published in May 4, 2020, it, they do mention that data analytics strengthen business by encouraging discipline thinking, keeping key decision makers focused, improving processes, and optimizing communication between business leaders and data experts in order to drive the right conversations for the success of the business. 
So data analytics is the key to driving productivity, efficiency, and revenue growth. So um, you know that organizations today heavily rely on IT systems, and accordingly, there are databases everywhere. So there are financial systems, HR systems, sales systems, CRM systems, and so on. So we need to make uh, informed decisions, and you cannot really do that without having proper data analytics, analyzing data and making sense of that data before you take those decisions. So the results of analyzing data, uh, data sets, is going to tell an organization where they can optimize, which processes can be optimized or automated, which processes can get better efficiencies out, and which processes are unproductive and thus have resources dedicated away. So all of this can help you in improving effectiveness and efficiency of the organization's processes and optimize the operations of the organization. Now, with that in mind, I would like to talk about the IIA standards that relate to data analytics. So if you analyze the IIA standards, you find the standard of proficiency uh, says that you, you know, the auditor should use available technology-based techniques to perform their assigned work. Due professional care also talks about the use of technology-based uh, audit and other data analysis uh, techniques. So well, IIA is the Institute of Internal Audit. And analysis and evaluation also talks about appropriate analysis and evaluation. So, you know, you have to do proper analysis and evaluation with large data sets that cannot happen without data analytics. So why do we need data analytics? And one of the big reasons we need data analytics is big data. And when we say big data, we mean data that has four characteristics. We call them four Vs. Tremendous volume of data. And that does not have to be for governmental institutions. It could be also for organizations. So when you talk about, for example, airlines, the ticketing, uh, how many transactions happen on a daily basis across the world in an era? And, and that is just an example of tremendous volume of data. Velocity, again, swift data processing. Data is being processed in a split of a second. So not only volume, but velocity as well. Variety, so you have many sources of data. Let's think about it. In your organization 20 years ago, in comparison with today, some organizations 20 years ago hardly had any kind of a computer systems to rely on, maybe some accounting software. Today, you can see that every organization has automated, or most organizations, their sales processes, I'm talking medium and large organizations, have automated their accounting, HR, operations in general, and so on. So everything is automated. And if they're not using an automated solution, they're at least using Excel. So there are a variety of data sources. And finally, veracity. And that would be the quality of data and accuracy of data. Unfortunately, not all data is accurate. So the more complex the data is and the larger the volumes of data is, some of it gets to be, some of it gets to be inaccurate. So with this concept, you need data analytics to make sense of this data and be able to take uh, meaningful decisions for the organization. Okay, so one concept that we need to differentiate uh, is, be is between data mining and data analytics. Now, I know that it is being used interchangeably, uh, data mining and data analytics, uh, but they have a difference. Okay. So data mining is used to collect and search for patterns. So collect data and search for patterns. Used with well-structured data. It is also known as knowledge discovery in databases. The output of data mining is data patterns. So you have large volumes of data, you analyze them to come up with a pattern, right? Data analytics is wider in scope. So I would say data mining is part of data analytics. Data analytics used to test, is used to test the hypotheses and translate findings into accessible information that can assist in decision-making. 
So you have a large volume of data. It doesn't have to be structured data, can be performed on any data. You analyze this data, and there are different types of analytics, not just trying to find uh, patterns, uh, descriptive, diagnostic, predictive, and prescriptive. And my colleagues here will be talking about these in a little while. The output of data analysis is verified hypotheses or insights on the data. So you start with the hypotheses. You might say, for example, you know, the maximum revenue discount or discounts on my revenue should be 10%. And then you test this across the database and see if that is the case or not. That's just an example. With that, we move on to uh, when you decide you want to do data analytics, you need to select your tool. And it's very important that there are certain factors that you consider when you select the tool for you to, there are many tools available to do data analytics. So let me just take them one by one with you and then comment on each of, of those separately. So the first is your business objectives. Why are you doing you know, data analytics? What's the purpose of your data analytics? So whatever platform, whatever tool you use should support both your existing and future business requirements. So you must identify the core objectives of your business and create, create a list of your desired business outcomes. Accordingly, you will decide which tool is better for you. Some tools are better in, for example, issuing visualization. Some tools are better in flexibility and so on. Uh, user interface. So, but business objectives are very important to start with. The second element is user interface and visualization. When we say user interface, we're talking about how user friendly it is. So you have different user types. So not all of them are data experts or data analytics experts. So you want to be able to allow them to use the system easily and effectively. And that, that is one of the measures, how, how, how easy it is to use. And when it comes to visualization, what kind of dashboards does your tool provide to explain the data that you have uh, or the results of the data analysis? Advanced analytics, the system should have the ability to recognize patterns in data and predict future trends, events, and outcomes. It must go beyond simple mathematical calculations and generate contextual insights, giving you the ability to build advanced statistical models. Again, integration. Uh, you, you do understand that you have, you know, for example, your systems. How integrated is it with your system? Can it, your, your core system or your data warehouse, can it integrate with the data warehouse? Can it get the information from that? It's easily without, without headache every time and interference of IT and so on. So with that in mind, multiple sources of data is also important. So it doesn't have to only integrate with your core system. You have to be able to import data from multiple sources. So let me tell you an example. You know, organizations might use different systems for HR, for finance, for banking, if it's a banking organization, whatever. So I want to be able okay, to pull out information from HR systems about the vacation of people. I want to be able to see also, to compare that against the log files of who conducted transactions during those vacation periods. So I want to be able to have two different sets of data imported, one from the HR system and the other is from the core banking system, for example, if it's a bank. And, com and compare who, you know, whether the person who was on vacation has executed any transaction during that period. If it comes out that he did, then that's a big red flag. Uh, that somebody is using his password or he conducted transactions while he should have been away and so on. Customization, uh, every business has unique requirements. So the data analytics tool that you choose should be able to be customized to meet your requirements and finally, security, and that's very important. When you take the time to import data from one or more than one source, it's important to make sure that this data is secure 
It's kept un, unta, intact, sorry. No one is able to play with it. And every test that you conduct on the data is saved. So you can go back and you know, select, ch check the results, check the hypotheses that you tested against, what kind of analysis you conducted, and so on. So security is very important element of your data analytics tool. So I've, I've, I did speak a lot so far, and now we have, um, now these are just examples of data analytics software that, you know, there are many more, uh, Excel, IDEA, uh, SAS, Python, and so on. Uh, for the sake of this uh, webinar and today and to next session, session two and session three, we will be using IDEA, IDEA data analytics software IDEA is a principal uh, partner with the Institute of Internal Audit. So uh, we have to show you a tool. Uh, we happen to be experts in that tool and uh, we, we, we know how to use it very well. So we'll use it to show you some of the data analytics uh, elements and how to conduct data analytics. So now we're gonna take a poll question and uh, it's just a question to ask you, what do you think the main reason your organization is using or if it's not using today, will use data analytics for in the future, okay? So uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Iman, our co-host, to uh, run the poll, please. So, uh, so Please take the time to answer the question. We're going to give you 30 seconds. I've allowed some more time because I know that uh, some of you are still uh, answering the poll. So please uh, allow me to extend the time a bit. We have a large number of participants and I want to give them all the chance to participate. Okay, I can see people are still voting. Okay, so I'm gonna end the poll now and share the results with you. So you can see uh, as per your answers, uh, the most of the highest two factors are to drive business efficiencies, to improve planning, budgeting, and forecasting, to improve risk management, to test and improve controls. Those are the four factors. So the highest two were drive business efficiencies and improve planning, budgeting, and forecasting. Now, let me share with you the results of uh, the poll that was conducted by the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants, the ACCA. And it seems to me that it's about the same, to tell you the truth. The results are very similar. So driving business efficiencies was the highest. Following that was improved planning, budgeting, and forecasting. And then risk management, improved risk management, and test and improved control. So the four factors are very similar to the ones that you have given me now. Okay, so uh, I'm going to stop here and see if anybody has a question. Uh, I'll ask my colleague Zaid to share those questions with me. Okay.
thing. Anybody has a question at all, please let us know. Okay, I didn't see any questions. There are no questions uh, up to this point. All right, thank you, Zaid. So I'm gonna move on to data analytics in internal audit. Yeah, the question or the, the, the elephant in the room, I guess, is how has the global pandemic impacted the internal audit profession, okay? And I'm gonna start with this and then elude a bit about how did it impact on using data analytics and IT tools within, for internal audit as a result of the pandemic. So let me, let me give you a bit of a background about a study that was conducted by Caseware. Caseware happens to be the developers of uh, IDEA. They conducted a study um, a survey covering 3,000 participants. Uh, 3,000 participants participated in that study. And 55% um, of them were from the uh, America, or North America, I would say. But the results say that eight out of 10 respondents indicated that they had either already made changes to the way they use technology in order or were reviewing their use of technology. So either they have changed already during 2020, or they are considering changes in the way they do audits. And it's quite understandable because actually the, the business itself, the operations of the organization might have changed. And people are working remotely and so on and so forth. We're not gonna get into what has impacted the organization, but it's, you know, it's clear that internal audit is saying, we have to change the way we do things. We have to do different things in diff using te technology. So my question to you is, did the pandemic result in any changes to the use of technology in your organization's internal audit function? And that's a poll again. Uh, can you please say run the poll, please? So the answer is one of three, either yes, we, we, are, we are planning to make changes, uh, we have already made changes, or we have not changed how we use technology. Okay, so we will end the poll there. So it seems that most participants um, have already made changes to the use of, in the use of technology in their internal audit functions. And again, that's a big indication. And, you know, I would say those, uh, the, the percentages here are higher. So 57% said we have already made changes. 28% said we are planning to make changes. 15% said we, we, we have not changed. So um, let, me, let me share with you the results of the poll. Uh, so in comparison with what we have here, actually more have either changed the way they did um, use technology or are planning to change the way they use technology. Let me ask you about the organization's internal audit budget because this was impacted uh, as a result of the pandemic. But I, I didn't share with you how was it impacted uh, in the survey shared by Caseware. Uh, so I thought, you know, let's discuss it first in our part of the world and then see how that compares to uh, the, the survey conducted by case work. So please let me know whether yes, it was reduced, no, it remained the same. 
or yes, it was increased. So this is valuable data to all of us because you know uh, we have a large number of professionals attending with us today from different organizations uh, across the Middle East, and I think you know this is valuable data. So can we end the poll here? Okay, let's hear the results. So forty-one percent said yes, it was reduced. 42% said, no, it remained the same. And 17% said it was increased. Now, let me compare that. Okay, so 17 increased, 41 reduced. So let me share that with what the result of the uh, survey says. 51% said it stayed the same. 31% said it was increased. Well, 18% said it decreased. Now, you can see that the numbers are a bit different. 31% said it increased versus 18% decreased and 51% remained the same. Uh, actually, a number of organizations realize that they have to increase their internal audit budget. As the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners issued a statement saying the number of fraud incidents as a result of COVID-19 has gone up in 2020 and it's expected to go even more up in 2021. So I would highly recommend for those organizations that have decreased their internal audit budget to have another serious look at the situation. Okay, so when it comes to strategic priorities, uh, the survey addressed what kind of strategic priorities are coming in the future for the internal audit functions. So whether it's a priority to address fraud and managing fraud risks, two, improving audit reporting and stakeholder communication, three, automating manual systems and processes, four, fulfilling compliance with regulatory requirements, five, improving remote workforce capabilities, six, training the workforce on audit technology, seven, using AI machine learning uh, and machine learning for audits. Eight, improving disaster slash crisis planning and preparedness. Nine, implementing or improving data analytics capabilities. 10, addressing changing workforce demographics. And 11, culture risk and the culture uh, audit. Now, let me share with you the results the most important five strategic priorities were compliance and regulatory requirements, managing fraud risk, and audit reporting and stakeholder communication, data analytics capabilities, and automated processes. So, um, you know, about uh, more than 40% uh, want to automate the processes and implement data analytics capabilities. So that's on their priority list. So uh, let me ask if there are any questions before I hand over to my colleague, Zayda Maidala, to start with the data analytics process. Uh, any questions so far on my part of the presentation? We have one question. What are the common use cases for data analytics in technology audits? So uh, let me just, uh, when, when we do technology audits, and I'm gonna give you an example, you have a lot of log files and they are tremendous in size. Attempts to penetrate your firewalls, network logins, errors in, in uh, entering uh, the passwords, uh, failure attempts or whatever. So you need to be able to analyze this and you need to be able to make sense out of it. So for example, I'm just gonna give you an example. When you look at the log files, and you go into the IT audit department and check whether somebody was able to enter a transaction, while, while, as, as an example I gave you earlier, while he was on vacation. That's a serious alarm to the uh, IT audit that uh, somebody was on vacation, but he was actually 
giving his passport to other colleagues to use. And, and that's, just a, that's just one simple example. There are many other examples relating to accessing the database, uh, accessing the physical uh, data center, uh, and many more that you can use with data analytics. I cannot cover them today, but uh, it could be another more advanced session in the future. Uh, but more examples can be built up, might be built up when my colleagues cover the remaining aspects of data analytics processes. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and uh, let Zay take over from there. Zay? Yes. So, good evening, everybody, and thank you for your interest in the subject of data analytics. I'm Zaid Obidalla, and I'm a consultancy director with the International Board Governance uh, Consultancy. Uh, I need to let you know from the get-go that from this point on, we are getting a bit technical in the process. So, when we are talking about the data analysis process, what do we mean exactly? What kind of steps are there that we are required to follow? So basically the data analysis process would follow some standard steps, if we call it that way. The first step, and it is considered quite a very key step, is understanding the problem and the desired result. What we mean here is that before we even begin working with the data, we need to understand what is it that we need to solve and what is the outcome that we are trying to achieve. Basically think of this as the objective of your uh, test, objective of your audit program, objective of your analysis. Without this objective, you will just be walking around the data without having any valuable output that you can generate from your work. So before you even consider starting through the, uh, your data analysis, you need to understand what is the objective that you are trying to achieve. Once we understand the objective, it's time to set uh, a clear metric on the subject. When we are talking about a metric, what we are basically saying here is, it, is that, what is it that you are going to measure? And how are you going to measure it? Are you working by, uh, is, is the purpose of your analysis is to identify total sales in a specific branch? or number of transactions in another uh, location. These are the metrics that you need to identify before you start working. And these metrics will also be linked to the ultimate objective of your entire analysis. Once we know the metric and we know the data, we know what we are going to measure and how we are going to measure it, we need to identify here the information that we need. Where are we going to, this, to get this information from? And how are we going to get this information? This part of the analysis would rely on your understanding of the data that you're working with, the structure of the data, the types of the data, in order for you to be able to identify what is the appropriate tool that you need in order to uh, extract this uh, information. And once this information is, is extracted, another key step is to clean that data. Because once you receive it, chances are you will face some quality issues in the data that would impact the accuracy of your analysis. So cleaning the data is considered a critical step because the analysis is not effective unless the data is clean and you need to make sure that it does not contain any missing incomplete values or outliers. For example, there is no point working in a data analysis relating ages when one of the ages is appearing as 150 years old, that's just automatically would start ruining your result. In addition to that, other than just cleaning the data, you need to make sure that your data is appearing in a standard format, especially if it is coming from multiple resources. Once the data is clean and we're comfortable and happy with it, we come down to the analysis part. In the analysis, we're talking about extraction, analysis from different perspectives, manipulation of the data, identifying correlation, identifying patterns. It all comes down to the point of what is it exactly that you're looking for. Once you know what is it that you're looking for, you would be able to know what kind of analysis do you need to do or you need to follow in order to reach your uh, required result. 
Once the analysis is, is completed, you have the result in front of you, you need to interpret their results. You need to evaluate your analysis to verify that it is defendable against possible objections. And you need to have an impact on the decision makers. That would mean that you need to have certain communication skills in order to create reports, dashboards, charts, or graphs, uh, or any other method that would allow you to present your information and provide it to the decision maker. These are the six key steps that should be followed in any data analysis process. So if you want to see a typical scenario for a data analyst, uh, if you want to see the day-to-day -day operations of a data analyst, he's going to be spending his days uh, extracting information, uh, applying uh, queries, creating reports, creating dashboards, and cleaning the data. So a typical scenario would be that he would receive a request. The request, or in other words, the objective. The client, who is a food chain restaurant, has a high level of expenses relating to regulatory fines. The client senses that the value and number of these fines is just too much for it to be a coincidence, and there is a potential problem in the company that we need to identify. So this is the request that you have received as a data analyst, and this is the objective that you need to keep in mind. What is the reason of these high, of this high regulatory points? What you need to do at this, top, uh, at this stage is start identifying the requirements. Basically, identify what you have, build the list of questions and the initial uh, hypotheses. So for in our situations, this can simply include uh, relevant uh, branch numbers, the detailed, uh, sorry, the detailed list of fines, uh, the relevant branch numbers, date and time of the fines, nature of the fines, is it something that is uh, related to food handling, is it something that's related to licensing? And before you start diving into the specifics, you need to start at this point creating a list of questions or a list of hypotheses as to just think out of the box. Are the fines concentrated around a specific location? Are they concentrated in specific hours of the day? Do we have multiple reasons for these fines? Are they related to, or mostly related to food handling or, or not? All of these would allow you to build the hypotheses. And this hypothesis is going to be what would guide you during your data analysis process. After that, we have identified the data sets. Basically, where is the information that I'm going uh, to look at? Where is the information that I would be isolating and analyzing in order to validate or refute my hypotheses? Based on the uh, requirements that we have identified, we would potentially need the list of uh, the entire locations that uh, has been, uh, uh, the entire locations that are available in our food chain restaurant. In order for us to link or look for a link between the fines and specific branches. We also would need timing uh, data in order to check whether there are fines concentrated in specific hours or during specific shifts. Once we have all of this data, we start working on analyzing the available information that we have. During the analysis, or our case here, we found that there's a concentration of fines in a few locations. Maybe you decide to go a little bit deeper in the analysis. Maybe you decide to check out the employment data and you suddenly note that all of these locations are supervised by the exact same three individuals. Then we, uh, you can look at the timing data and there you have it. You suddenly find that all of the fines were incurred when the same supervisor was on duty. So this would give you an indication that this supervisor was not following company procedures. He was doing something wrong that just incurred the uh, fines on a continuous basis and therefore broke protocol. Once we have this information, it comes down to the aspect of uh, presenting the results. We are confident in our findings. We are ready to present it to stakeholders. What you need to do at this point is that you need to share the data sources that you have, and you need to share the process of how you uh, arrived at your analysis. This is just to give credibility to your work because without this information, without this detail, the decision maker may just start getting skeptical about how did you reach this result? So all of this is done by the data analyst. But let's talk about who's also involved in, uh, in working with data. 
because there are multiple parties, especially that we are dealing with three chapters that are involved in the data analysis. So we start with the data engineer. Data engineer are people who would develop and maintain data architecture and make data available for business operations. They are the ones who work within the data to extract, integrate, and organize data from various resources. They are also responsible to clean, transform, and prepare data uh, uh, in order for the final user to be able to utilize them. Then comes our star, the data analyst. The data analyst would translate the data and numbers into plain languages. This would allow organizations or whoever is making the decision to make decisions. So the data analyst's role is going to be to inspect and clean the data for driving insights, identify correlations, find patterns, and possibly apply statistical methods. He is going to be responsible to answer questions such as, is there a possible correlation between uh, the movement of uh, more than one product? And lastly, we come to the final stage, which is the data scientist. The data scientist would analyze data for actionable insights and build machine learning or deep learning models that would train on past data to create predictive models. They are the people who would answer questions such as, what percentage of my customers am I likely going to lose in the next quarter to the competition? Or is this financial transaction unusual for a particular customer or not? So it's a next level of data analysis. But since we are focusing on data analysts, let's see what kind of skills are required uh, for a data analyst. There are three types of skills required for any data analyst, technical, functional, and soft skills. So if we are talking about technical skills, data analysts is required to have an experience in using spreadsheet. This is obviously the number one activity because that's where all of your work is going to be. He also needs to have proficiency in statistical analyzation and visualization tools. This is going to be to assist the decision maker in making this decision because decision makers just do not like to look at numbers. They're more of a graph and visualization kind of people. He would also preferably have some kind of proficiency in one program language, similar to Python or uh, R. And he would have a good knowledge of SQL for working with databases and the ability to access and extract data from data repositories. When it comes to functional skills, the data analyst is, is expected to have proficiency in statistics that would allow him to understand the data that he has extracted validate his analysis and identify any possible errors. He also needs to have analytical skills for him to be able to interpret the data, possibly uh, make theories, or as we said, build the hypotheses and make potential forecasts. He needs to be, uh, to be able to uh, solve problems with his problem, uh, problem solving skills. That visualization that would allow him to decide on the techniques and tools to present his findings efficiently and lastly, project management skills that would allow him to manage the process, the people, and the entire project altogether. And lastly, we come down to the soft skills. This is lastly, but it's definitely not the least, because a data analyst may have perfect technical skills and perfect functional skills, but without the soft skills that would allow him to present his information to the decision maker, nobody's, just, nobody's going to listen, basically, at that. So when it comes down to soft skills, we are talking about his ability to work with businesses and cross-functional teams because he would be obtaining data from multiple resources. He needs to have the skills to communicate effectively in order to report and present his findings. He needs to be able to tell a compelling and convincing story. And above all, he needs to be continuously curious in conducting his work. So what kind of data would the data analysts work with? So basically there are, data can be unorganized, it can be from multiple resources, it can be from all over the place. So when we are talking about type of data, one way that we can categorize data is by its structure. So there's structured, semi-structured, and unstructured. So if we want to talk briefly about these, when we are talking about structured data, we are talking about data that is well-defined, it has a specific data model. It can be uh, shown in a tabular manner with rows and columns. It can be shared and completely understandable 
without having uh, any potential problems. So an Excel file would be a perfect example on structured data. Semi-structured data is data that has some organizational property, but lacks a fixed or rigid schema. So such data cannot be stored in form of a, a direct form of uh, rows and columns. Such examples would include emails, XML language, binary executables, or uh, such other uh, programs. And lastly is unstructured data, which is data that does not have an easily identifiable structure and therefore cannot be organized in a proper manner in, in, for, in a form of uh, rows and columns. So this includes web pages, videos and audio files, social media, PDF files or PowerPoint presentation. Now, what you may ask here is why do you need to know the difference of types of data? The, question, the answer is going to be basically because you need to understand what is the tool that you need to work with the data. If you have an you know, understanding of the structure of the categorization of the data, you would be able to identify what is the appropriate tool for you to use in order to extract the data from each one of these resources. An Excel file can be easily shared and uh, read by multiple sources, but a PDF file would require some additional, uh, additional work. That's why you need to have an understanding of the categorization of the data. Now, if we want to ask a poll question, what type of data is typically found in databases and spreadsheets? Allow me to share this poll with you. And you should see it in front of you right now. So please give me what you think. And thank you for that. I am ending the poll now. So what you can see is that the majority of you has answered that it is structured data, which is the appropriate response because the key word in the question was that it's a spreadsheet. It's a, by definition, a spreadsheet would have a specific columns, specific rows, and therefore it would be appropriately structured, which is the appropriate response in our, uh, in our question here. Now, in addition to working with multiple data uh, categories, there are multiple data formats. So when we are talking about data formats and as a data professional, you will be working with a variety of file types. If you are uh, an auditor working for a firm, it would depend on your client, what kind of information or what kind of format or structure does your client's uh, system produce. If you are working in a company, it would rely on how many systems does your company uh, have. Each system would issue its own results. It would issue its own uh, reports in its own formats. That's why as a data professional, you need to be comfortable dealing with any type of data that you, may, uh, that you may be faced with. So if we are talking about the common types of data, we have delimited text files, Microsoft Excel spreadsheets, extensible markup language XML, or portable document format PDF. So let's visit each one of these briefly. When we are talking about delimited text files, it's a clear cut, we have all worked with them. But what we need to highlight when we are talking about delimited text files, is that the, the key point here is the delimiter. What's the delimiter? The delimiter is basically the sequence of one or more characters that are specifying the boundaries between the different fields or basically different columns. If the delimiter was a comma, which is the most common delimiter, it's a comma separated value or a CSV file. If the delimiter is a tab, it's a tab separated value or a TSV file. So as you see in front of you, we have two screens where the delimiter once is a comma and the other time is a tab. You can see how 
the value size is different, but it is still uh, spaced by the delimiter. If you have if you have a, uh, a text file that has commas within the data, then a comma separated value or using the comma as a delimiter would not assist you in extracting the result and you would need to find a new delimiter to help you read the data. The next type of file is the most common file, Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. It's, uh, it can be used by any system, any format. There's no problems with it. Uh, it's a clear cut with its rows and columns. And the key point here is that it is available in, uh, it, it is one of the most secure uh, file formats as it in itself cannot contain malicious code. Now, it is generally common, but quite difficult to actually see the extensible markup language or XML. It's a markup language with set rules for encoding data. The XML file format is both readable by humans and machines. It is a self-descriptive language designed for sending information over the internet. If you do face uh, dealing with XML, then you need to make sure that you have the appropriate tool that would allow you to extract the information from XML in a way that you would be able to understand and properly analyze. And finally, the portable document file format, the PDF file which is basically a file format developed by Adobe to present results. Sorry, to present documents independent of application software, hardware, or operating system. This means that it would open in the same way on any device. This kind of format is frequently used in financial documents, such as bank statements, and it can also be used to fill in data uh, when used frequently as forms. Now, again, the question would be, why do you need to understand all of these types of files? Because you have no control over where, where your data can be. Your data may be in a bank statement as a PDF file, or it can be in a list of transactions as an Excel file or a CSV file. You need to be familiar with all of the types of the possible formats in order for you to be able to know what kind of tool do you need in order to be able to extract information and ultimately apply your analytics on it. So we have identified the structure of the data. We have identified the types of the data. Now let's start gathering this data. Where do we get data from? Basically, data has never been as dynamic and diverse as they are today. With this technological expansion, there are new sources uh, coming up every other day. So when we are talking where data come from, from our perspective, we can just simply cover it in two ways. It's either internal resources or external sources. Organizations typically have for internal applications that would support them in their day-to-day -day activities, in their customer transactions, human resources, or possibly workflows within their operations. They have their databases, whether it's uh, SQL databases, Oracle, SAP, or whatever that would allow them to store the data in a structured way. Uh, this information can be a valuable source uh, for your data analysis. We are talking about data that can be used from a retail transaction system, for example. It can be used to analyze sales in different regions or the data from a customer relationship uh, management system that can be used for making uh, forecasts or sales projections. On the other hand, we have the external sources, which are external to the organization possibly publicly available, possibly privately available data sets. It all depends on what kind of information do you need in order to be able to extract your uh, data. So if you want to have a practical example right now, your client has asked you to conduct an audit on one of their departments, which recently downsized and offered generous departure incentive packages to numerous employees. This is the information that we're provided with, so we need to start breaking it down. However, management has heard that many of the employees has been rehired as contractors shortly after receiving that incentive package. Some were doing the same job and some were ironically sitting at the same desk. Your client wants you to examine their record and determine if this is true and if so, how widespread the practice is. So what we basically have is that we have a company the company has uh, asked a number of employees to leave. 
but these employees have came back to work as contractors. So that's the objective. That's the key part of the analysis. First of all, identify your objective. A company wants us to know whether people who left the company came back to work as contractors. Now let's think about this for a second and think exactly how am I supposed to know that? What is the source of information that I need in order to know that? So let's start by identifying the required data. The first step would be to determine the information that we, we need to collect. This basically needs to cover what information do you need and possibly where are you going to get this information from? Your goals, your ultimate goals gives you the answer to your question. So let's think about our case study. Our case study was that we have employees who left the company and then later came back to work as consultants. Based on this, we probably need to have a list of the people who left the company as a very as a, as a starter. Possibly that list is going to be available with the HR department. So that with that, we have identified the information that we need and we have identified a possible source for this data. But this data on its own is not enough because this will just let you know who left. What you also need to know who got paid. So we need a list of payments made to contractors. Possibly we get that from finance or procurement based on the company that you are working with. So with that, we have the information that we need and we have the possible sources of the data. After that, we need to define a plan for collecting the data. When we say define a plan, what we mean is, what is the time frame for the data that you're collecting? Do you want the data since the company first was established or do you want it for the last year or do you want it for yesterday? This is the time frame that you need to decide and based on the request that you receive from management. And you need to have just the right amount of data to make your, uh, your analysis credible. For example, some statistical tools are meaningless unless you have a thousand records or, or more. So in our example, the information that was provided to us is that management is only concerned about employees who left, then came back to work as contractors. The company maintains a complete set of HR and payment record, and they just threw in an information that company's retirement age is 65. The best option would be to obtain the HR and payment records from the date when the company first started offering their incentives. And with that, you have identified a plan for collecting the data. You have identified the time frame for your data. We move on to determining the collection method. How are you going to get the data? There are some companies that have a dedicated form that would usually be sent to IT departments. There are some companies that would allow you to integrate directly with the company's information to extract that data yourself. You need to understand what is your current position and how are you going to get this data from? Um, do I need to contact IT? Even if I do need to contact IT, what kind of information should I actually give them? Do I need to give them uh, the period, the data file? What do you need to give them? That, so that would depend on your organization and the data governance uh, in the organization. Once you know how you're going to collect your data, it is time to actually collect the data. So it is time to send the required emails, fill the required forms, and do what is necessary to start collecting this information. You need to watch out at this point for issues relating to data governance. This includes uh, security, regulations, or compliance, because especially when you're obtaining HR related data or customer related data, things start getting a little bit sensitive because if any of this information leaks out, you will be subject to regulatory uh, fines. So data privacy and data governance is a crucial part for your work in order to make sure that you always maintain the confidentiality of your data. Once we collect the data, as we said before in the steps, it is time to clean it. Why do we need to clean the data? Because poor quality data weakens your competitive standings and undermines your objectives. Missing, inconsistent, or incorrect data can lead to false conclusions and therefore will result in effective, ineffective decisions and that can be quite costly. So when we are talking about data cleaning, there are basically three steps that we need to go through. 
data inspection, cleaning the data, and verifying our work. So when we are talking about data inspection, this would include uh, detecting errors, validating the work, profiling the data, visualizing the data. And to do all of that, you can use any script or tools that would allow you to define specific rules and constraints that would allow you to validate your data against these rules and constraints. So when we're talking about profiling and visualization, you can inspect sources of data to understand the structure, content, and relationship of your data, and possibly discover any anomalies. So when we come down to the types of, uh, to the data cleaning itself, there are common problems that you can encounter whenever you are uh, dealing with data cleaning. We start with missing values. Missing values are a factor that you need to work with immediately. Is the missing value would represent just a blank line or does it represent a gap in the actual uh, sequence? Because each one has its own different meaning. And that's why you need to have a very clear understanding on what is the reason of this missing value in order for you to later uh, enhance your, uh, your analysis results. Other than missing values, there are potential duplicate values, which are basically data points that are repeated may be repeated by error, may be repeated due to the system, may be repeated due to the importation process when you started exporting the data. Once you identify that this is a mistake, you need to get rid of it. And you also need to be careful about data type conversion or formats. You need to standardize your data in order to be able to work with it. You need to make sure that if a column uh, contains uh, dates, or is a, if a column is re, uh, related to only dates, it should only have dates and not a number or a character field within it. And then we are also working with syntax errors. Syntax errors can be for any reason. It can be for format, typos, or basically uh, white space or extra space. Whatever the reason is, it needs to be treated because it will have an impact on the analysis that you are working. And then there is irrelevant data. It's not necessarily an error. It's just something that you basically don't need. So for example, if you're analyzing data about the health of a population, the contact number may not be a very crucial factor for your analysis and you can probably skip it. And lastly, we have outliers. When we are talking about outliers, they may or may not be incorrect. So uh, if we, as we said in the example that uh, if, if you are working with data for an employee, ages of the employees, and you have an employee who is two years old, that's obviously an incorrect outlier. But if you are working with data that, uh, regarding annual salary, you have a, one person who has an annual salary of 100,000, another person 200,000, and that's the average. But then you have a person who is an average salary of a million. It's not exactly wrong because maybe his, his actual salary is a million, but it is still an outlier that would ruin the entire average of your calculation. So it is something that you need to take into consideration and get out of your data to treat with separately. Once you have treated all of the data, you would start to verify your results. So you need to verify the result to make sure that uh, the accuracy was indeed achieved as required in the inspection process. And you would also, it, it is, it's not a bad idea to re-inspect re the data to make sure that the constraints are still uh, upholding. By constraints, we mean here possibly uh, date range or value range or average. And the very key point is that you need to document all of the changes that you make. Not just the changes, but also the reasons as to why did you do these changes in the first place. So we have another poll question here relating to the cleaning the data. When cleaning your data relating to the age of an employee working in finance department, you noted that an employee is appearing as five years old. What is the type of this error? Let me just open the poll. And here you go.
and let's close the poll and let's see the result. We have 36% of you who said that it's an outlier, which is the correct answer because you are working with the ages of the employees. So we can't really call it an irrelevant data. And since it did not appear as an error, it's not a syntax error. For it to be a syntax error, it needs to clearly say that it's an error. And therefore, since it is ages of the employee, that you have an employee who is five years old, it is an outlier that you need to extract out of your data. So to remember that, you need to remember the definition of an outlier. It is something that is completely out of your data set in just plain terms. Okay. Now, once we have cleaned the data, let's start talking about what can we do with it? What kind of analysis can we do with it? So for that, we have four types of analysis, analytics that can be performed on the data. We have descriptive analytics, which is basically answering the question, what happened over a given period of time? Or uh, it would uh, help you just present information to the stakeholder and provide essential insights into past event, just pure what happened. Uh, so, for example, it would track past performance based on key performance indicators, or it would monitor uh, past cash flows. The second type would be diagnostic analytics. Diagnos diagnostic analytics relates to the subject, why did it happen? Okay, so we know what happened, but now we need to ask ourselves, why did the issue happen? So this is, uh, uh, you need to dig deeper in order to actually find the cause of the relevant outcome. So, for example, uh, we can say that an increase in sale happened in a region where there has been no change in marketing. Third type is predictive analytics. Predictive analytics, just to answer the question, what will happen? So when we are talking about predictive analytics, we're talking about historical data and trends that are used to predict future outcomes. This can possibly predict risk assessments or for sales forecast. It is important, however, to highlight here that predictive analytics it's not to say what will happen, but it's to forecast it because at the end of the day, it's just based on probability. And lastly, <coughs> sorry, lastly is prescriptive analytics, which would answer the question, what should we do about it? We see the predictive analytics is telling me that uh, there are these potential factors based on uh, X, Y, Z probability. So what should we do? It analyzes these past decisions, it analyzes the likelihood of different outcomes, and it estimates the course of action that should be taken. Uh, similar to an airline, when they start adjusting their ticket prices, why do they do that? Because they conduct prescriptive analytics based on customer demands and based on gas prices and based on weather or based on traffic on uh, connecting routes. So basically, these are the four types of analytics that can be conducted uh, on the data. Now, what I want to do at this point is that I want to share. Now, as we said at the beginning, is that we are going to use caseware idea for the uh, for the purposes of this presentation or this webinar uh, to showcase the potential analysis. So, what I wanted to show you here is that the screen is that I want you to go back to the case study where we were responsible to find out whether there are people who left the company and came back. I want to actually show you the data that we received. This is the file that we have received from HR. It's departures with incentives. It would give us the serial number, name, date of birth, age, gender, employee ID, departure date, and salary. This is departure uh, the employees who left. And then we were also uh, provided with a list of payments. But look, this list of payments, this list of payments is not an Excel file. It's a, a PDF file. And let's face it, it's uniquely formatted. That's why you need to understand the structure. And that's why you need to understand the different types of formats, because you need to understand or know and identify the tool that would help you extract the information out of these files and help you identify or conduct the analysis that we that you uh, you need to do 
To do that, I use my system uh, idea. So I have extracted the contract data here. I have it available in front of me and I have the departure with incentive file here. What I did at the very first beginning is that I ran a result analysis. Just a second, let me find it. On the departure with incentives. When I ran the analysis, I just ran a simple visualization and you can immediately see the outliers. So you can see here that there is actually a two-year-old on the uh, in the age field and that there is a six-year-old. And remember when they gave us that piece of information that we didn't really know why they gave it to us, when they said that the retirees are after 65 years old. So we have all of these ranges after 65 years old reaching to a one guy who's 98. So all of this data is outliers. We either remove them or we understand why are they outliers and act in order to uh, make sure that it would not have an impact on our analysis. So this one who is appearing as two year old, if you want to see, you can see that his date of birth actually says September 10, 55. That means that his age is definitely not two year old. So that would mean that when I apply an analysis on the age of the employees, I should not rely on the age field. I should recalculate the age field on, on my own using the date of birth and then analyze my analysis or apply my analysis. Because if I use the age field, that would mean that I would not get correct results due to these outliers. So going back to the actual objective, what we had was that we have a list of departures with incentives, and then we had a list of uh, payments made to outside parties. What we did for this analysis is that we need to keep in mind what was the objective. The objective is who left and then got paid. So basically we need to look for people who are available in both databases. So this database has 999 records. This database has 960 records. I used a join feature here available in IDEA to get a database that is 375 records who are available in both databases. Let's get back to the objective. Actually, let me get back to you over here. Where is the slide? Just a second. Management is only concerned about employees who left, then came back to work as contractors. By definition, you may actually face a number of employees who were paid first as contractors, but then became employees and then left. They would also appear here. That would mean that you need to apply an analytic that would find employees who were paid after the date of departure. It's a simple analytic that actually gave me a database of 369 uh, records. So these 369 records are basically all of the employees who left the company. Remember, this is out of the 999. 369 employees who left the company and then came back and, got, and uh, were paid as independent contractors. And now I am confident in my results I am ready to present my information to uh, management and show them the amount of basically loss that uh, they were subject uh, that they were subject to see. And with that, we would have completed an introduction on the uh, on in, an introduction on data analytics. What's going to happen next, or what I would uh, the webinar next is going to cover, as Mr. Nasser has said. Next level of data analytics in terms of data visualization, trend analysis, and sampling using data analytics. This sampling part uh, is not just an issue of taking random sample because there are so many ways, statistical methods, that you can rely on in order to select your sample. That would be addressed in session two, along with future advancements and artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence would cover outlier because the outlier that I did was just a very simple method, but there are a better method uh, or there is a better method to extract it. And that would be covered in session two. In session three, we would be talking more on data analytics and how it can help you detect fraud or 
to a closer extent how it can help you detect red flags that would allow you to detect fraud. This would include applying Benford's law, uh, uh, analyzing uh, data to, to see signs of fraud using practical examples. And with that, I have finished the webinar. Uh, let's see Thank if we have any questions. We have a number of questions, so I'm going to start with the first ones first. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the first question relates to the presentations. Uh, so, so I think it was Mr. Sorry, before that, Radir. Radir asked a question. Uh, Ms. Radir, when you said uh, COVID-19 uh, impacting technology, internal audit, or the way internal can you provide specific examples, meaning using MS Teams. Actually, um, communication tools are one of them, but you know there are only a minimum amount, uh, of part of what we're talking about. But uh, the most important is technology that is used to verify how people are working independently and whether they are securely accessing the network and so on. So monitoring the network and technology that will help you do analyze this data and technology that will help you speed up the process of audit and improve efficiency. So that was what we meant by the, uh, the question. Um, the second question is from Mr. Samir. And he's asking about the presentations. Um, uh, we need to discuss with our partners, uh, the Institute of Internal Audit, uh, ISACA, and uh, the Institute of Management Accountants, uh, what's the next step? How do we you know, make them available? Probably after the three sessions, uh, inshallah. So we're gonna get back to you on this after we consult with our partners because it's mainly their decision, it's not just ours. Um, a third question is about, from Mr. Hussein, has to do with uh, AI and automation. Uh, are taking a lot of the data analytics work, what does the future look like for data analysts? How will this role evolve? And that's a good question. Uh, partly will be addressed in session two, uh, next session. But I'm going to just elude on that one. The same analytics tool that we are using today, the same analytics tools we are using today are developing fast to include AI in them. So the role of the data analyst is going to be still there, not just to write scripts on how to, you know, to program the data the analytics work, because it will be already programmed, but he needs to interpret the data, he needs to make sense of it. Okay, as, as the example that uh, Zaid has just showed us, when he looked at the data and saw the age groups as uh, incorrect, the age fields as incorrect, he reached to a conclusion as a data analyst that he should recalculate the age by relying on the date of birth. So there will always be a job for the data analyst, but his role will evolve with the data analytics tools as they evolve as well. So, uh, Mr. Amro could be also asked a question relating to the presentation, uh, whether we can get the presentation. Uh, of course, uh, we, as I said, we will discuss it with our partners and, and see how we can make them available for you, uh, whether you can download them from someplace or, I, I, you know, we, we will get back to you probably after the third session. So uh, IDEA as a tool, uh, IDEA is, is developed by a case, caseware international. It's, uh, it's, it's I call the caseware IDEA. If, if you need more information, you can visit caseware IDEA website or visit our website, which is albarco.com. Uh, and you can get information about it. Uh, and we shall be pleased to provide additional information. Uh, one more question is, again, Ms. Vadir. Suppose one of the analysts' uh, objectives related to age, how you can depend on information provided in spreadsheet. That's a very good point, by the way. You know, if somebody comes and gives you a spreadsheet, are you going to rely on the information? Now, if my role is just an analyst, 
okay? I would rely on the information provided to me. If I was an internal auditor, I would not just simply rely on the spreadsheet. I will make sure it's automatically, whatever data is directly extracted from the source, which is from the system. Um, uh, again, that's, that's, that's a very good question because but when you deal with a spreadsheet, like for example, Excel, it doesn't keep the integrity of the source data so people can change it. And, and, and you need to be careful with that. So instead of relying on spreadsheets, you want to extract data directly from the system. And uh, allow me to add easy. a point to that, is that during the data cleaning, as we said that the last stage was verification. Uh, a step that can be added to the verification is the reconciliation with the original data. How does the reconciliation work? Is that, for example, you can just by simply adding up the total of the age field, the number is meaningless, but just if, think of it as a metadata and compare it to the total number of age field from the system. If the total number would match, that would mean that the extraction from the system into the spreadsheet has uh, a high confidence level that it was um, uh, imported correctly. So there are control activities that you can conduct after you extract the information that would allow you to have some comfort that the information that you have is still safe and accurate. One last question for you, Zaid, is what is the difference? Uh, again, uh, I think it was Mr. Aramli, Bilal Aramli. Uh, can IDEA analyze unstructured data? Well, the PDF file that we have just seen right now is considered an unstructured data. And the, with some practice, you, you can simply import it into the system without any problem. The trick is just to have a clear understanding of the categorization of the data and the capabilities of the system that you are using. I'm comfortable with IDEA. I'm very much familiar with IDEA. I'm happy with the system. I know that it can do this extraction and therefore I used it to extract the PDF file, the, the, the unstructured file. Uh, now, one more question is, what is the difference between data analytics and business intelligence and dashboarding? It's not much of a difference as much as it is complementary steps. You cannot have a dashboard without data analytics first. So for example, when I extracted the visualization, uh, the, the method of uh, to identify if there are any outliers, I had to first of all do an analysis on the age first. So data analytics would give you the result in a form of rows and columns that can be later translated into uh, a dashboard that is specific to your need or that you can possibly present to your management. Uh, Mr. Osman Yaqub uh, is, uh, is thanking us for the way we give practical examples. Uh, I want to comment there that uh, there will be more examples in the coming two sessions as well. And I had a question, I'm not sure if you got it, from Mr. Uh, Ashraf. I'm still in the sequence now. Oh, okay. Uh, do internal authors need to learn Python, SQL, or other programming languages? Um, let me tell you something. If you have if you have a good data analytics tool, you can just use it immediately without learning Python. So all of our data analytics experts do, are not programmers on our Python. Um, but however, if you do know Python, it will help you. Uh, depending on the data analytics tool you use, for example, with IDEA, it will help you program advanced analytics. And again, uh, that is something I cannot answer because I don't have expertise in it. And to add more to that, when we are talking about IDEA, for example, it has its own out of the box features. But if you know Python personally, I don't know Python, but if you do know Python, you can write a script, your own script, something that is dedicated for your needs, for your company's needs, that would enhance the result of your analytics and help you add value to your organization. So Mr. Rami Al-Zibdiye, I think he is asking a question, are Studio program better than Excel spreadsheet for better analytics? Uh, there is, uh, we cannot comment on that, but let me tell you something. Excel is a good tool. However, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, 
preserve this, the, the, the data, the source data. So it can, you can easily change the data uh, when you conduct your analytics, and, and that's a big weakness. Plus, it depends on the number of records you want to analyze. If they're not large, if they're within the millions, one, two million, whatever, the system will not be very slow. However, if you go up the ladder, it will become slower. So you need to do with your comparison based on your objectives. Uh, Mr. Ahmed Lizghoul, uh, in our company, we use ACL. It's a well-known tool. Yes, I know it. While during this session, I found an idea probably more user friendly than ACL. We do hear that a lot. So some of our customers using uh, IDEA have said that they converted from ACL because it was easier to use. Um, yes, we, 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 we know that you know, many, many people using IDEA prefer it on ACL because of user interface. Um, Mr. Amr Kurdi, uh, from how can I validate the data represented to me? Again, that was answered by Zaid when he mentioned that you look at the source data, where it was extracted from, and then you compare the records, the totals with the ones that you extracted it from, just to make sure that everything's all imported properly. So that, that process of comparison is, is an important step to verify the data. Uh, Mr. Mortez Zarababa, you have mentioned the, abil the ability to execute is essential while selecting the best fit data analytics tool, usually how much time it takes to build a workflow using a new system. Is it easy for a business user to be able and how much usually would it take him to do so? So when you talk about a workflow, uh, the question, let me tell you what I understand from the question. So uh, the workflow is somebody doing the analytics, somebody revising it and somebody approving it that is not available in IDEA. However, IDEA can be programmed to cater for that with additional tools built on. Um, for example, we're talking to the Central Bank of Saudi Arabia now in order to do robotics. So uh, data analytics will keep working on their data continuously based on programs. So it, there is some programming to be done there, again, you know, using other tools to, on the back of it. But that's really advanced analytics. So um, if, if that's your question, workflow is, is not within idea at this stage. Uh, Mr. Tariq Abdullah, what about the cognitive analytics? Zaid, do you know uh, an answer? What, what, what is it, sorry? Cognitive analytics. Cognitive analytics, no, I need to look into Sorry, Tarek. I, I really don't know what cognitive analytics is, but uh, all right. So with that, we conclude with the questions. I think I have a question from my side. I think that we didn't, didn't get from Mr. Ashraf. I can't read his name. Please. Yeah. Can you please advise if I can use a mixture of data in my analysis, mixing between unstructured and structured? Well, the answer is yes, because Basically, you need to make sure to complete your analytics. So let's suppose that you received a bank statement. Most likely you will receive it as PDF file. And you want to test it for payments against payments from the finance system within the company, an Excel sheet structured. We can't stop just because there are two file types. So you need to find the data analytical tool, which as I used it in IDEA when I compared the contractor payment file against the departure file, to find a way to standardize between these two, to, to import it and be able to work on it regardless of where, wherever the source format was. All right, uh, so I think, I think we, uh, we, we have reached uh, the time limit. Uh, we have exceeded the time limit actually. So it's now 8.34. Uh, let me uh, thank you all for attending. I really appreciate your time. Um, and I appreciate that, that most of the attendees stayed with us all the way until the end. And, and, uh, and, and that means you know, that that subject yeah. is really of interest to you all. Uh, it is an important subject, to be honest. I hope we can see you again on sessions two and three. Uh, I, I really would like to thank again uh, the, uh, Mr. Ahmed Al Qawaspe, President of the IIA Jordan, Mr. Nassim Karmash, President of the IMA Jordan, and Mr. Hussam Khattab, President of ISACA and Imam Bhutai, for making this happen. The collaboration between all of us was great. 
And uh, the content created was really due to the uh, feedback and input. So thank you all, uh, and thank you for attending with us today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you on session two, inshallah. Thank you, everybody, and take care. Assalamu alaikum.